Welcome to All Arts Talks Recovery, The Artists. We are live on YouTube, Facebook, and allarts.org. My name is Joran Weisbrot, and I'm the Artistic Director of All Arts. Two weeks ago, the brilliant Karen Hopkins, President Emerita of the Brooklyn Academy of Music and Artistic Advisory Committee member of All Arts, moderated the first talk in this series titled All Arts and Recovery with a group of theater and museum directors, cultural leaders, and Broadway producers. The panel talked about institutional ways out of the crisis. Karen Hopkins developed the five action items for institutions during this crisis. One, cut expenses to the bone. Two, keep the family of donors, audiences, constituents, and artists close. Gather data, know the facts. Four, develop several contingency plans. Five, come up with one big, bold, artistic idea that you can execute that defines who you are. But how are the artists faring in this crisis? Where, I, where are they in this five-point plan? Those who have relied on commissions for a new piece of dance, theater, concert engagements, museum or gallery shows to survive. How have institutions kept close with artists? What are artists doing to stay creative, to invent new sources of revenue? Or simply put, how do they survive creatively and literally? And how do they see the future of their field? Is there a creative revolution on the horizon? Or is it the digital space and artists uh, the digital space and artistic dead end. How do they feel about the deluge of free online content? The New York Times headline recently, the fall of autumn, live performance producers are giving up on 2020. Taylor Swift and Justin Bieber have postponed their tours, the Times informed us. But what about the performers who are not making millions a night, whose livelihood and grocery bills depends on the next gig? Is any of the Paycheck Protection Program money actually landing in artists' hands? With ticket sales stalled and many artists out of work, a new study reveals that nonprofit arts and cultural sector faces an estimated $6.8 billion loss, the equivalent to an average 26% deficit among organizations. The arts create massive revenue for cities and communities, yet the contract and fees for artists are the first ones to go during a pandemic. Artists are maybe the, the ones that can envision a new way forward beyond this crisis, not only for the arts, but also for our society. While a lot of institutions are merely trying to find mechanisms of how to make the old model work again. Timed entries, more sanitary stations, leaving seats empty, robots as virtu virtual gallery visitors, etc. But shouldn't we have bigger visions than this? Do we even know yet the full extent of this crisis? And aren't we looking for solutions where we haven't grasped the problem fully? Who says that we have to give up on 2020 only? The Indian novelist Arundhati Roy said on 60 Minutes recently, I mean, the dumbest thing to do would just be to set up all the pins in the bowling alley one more time exactly the same way. And yet, that is what we're trying to do in this country. In her essay in the final Financial Times, she writes at the end, nothing could be worse than to return to normality. Historically, pandemics have forced humans to break with the past and imagine their world anew. This one is no different. It's a portal, a gateway between one world and the next. We can choose to walk through it, dragging the carcasses of our prejudice and hatred, our avarice, our data banks and dead ideas, our dead rivers and smoky skies behind us. Or we can walk through lightly with little luggage, ready to imagine another world and ready to fight for it. Artists are the ones who can travel the most lightly, who can leave their luggage behind. A lot of them had their luggage already taken away from them as their concert tours, performing engagements and commissions vanished. So let's hear from them. Our panelists today are composer Paola Prestini, who's known both for her otherworldly, outright, gorgeous music, according to the New York Times, as well as the visionary in chief and co-founder and artistic director of the nonprofit music organization, National Sawdust. Dubois Akin is a creative director, choreographer, producer, and filmmaker, a true Renaissance spirit. He's the founder and director of Akin Brand, a creative agency and production company. As a Georgia native and now New York-based artist and businessman, Akin started his professional career as a professional dance career, touring, teaching, and performing for five years with the renowned dance company Urban Bushwoman. Canadian-born 
Former New York, now LA-based choreographer Azure Barton is the founder and director of Azure Barton and Artists and has collaborated with celebrated dance artists and companies, including Mikhail Baryshnikov, American Valley Theater, Teatro La Scala, Elvin Ailey American Dance Company, and Hubbard Street Dance in Chicago, among many, many others. She choreographed the Broadway production of the Three Penny Opera with starring Cindy Lauper and Alan Cumming. She teaches dance alongside Bill Forsyth at the University of Southern California's Gloria Kaufman School of Dance. Taylor Mack, inaugural artist in residence of All Arts, who uses Judy as gender pronoun, is our fourth panelist. Judy is a playwright, actor, singer-songwriter, performance artist, director, and producer. Judy's 24-hour decade history of popular music has toured worldwide and was critically acclaimed as maybe one of the most important pieces of theater and performance art of the new millennium. Taylor's piece, Gary, a sequel to Titus Andronicus, was performed on Broadway starring Nathan Lane. Taylor is a MacArthur Fellow. I asked each of the four artists to give us an opening statement loosely addressing the following three questions. One, what work have you lost during the pandemic or due to the pandemic? Two, how do you survive literally and creatively during this time? And three, how do you see the future of your work and the arts in general? I'd like to start with Paola. Thank you so much. Hi, Jorn. Thank you so much for having all of us. I'm happy to be here. Wonderful. Uh, should I dive in? Yes, please. All right. Um, so the, the losses were intense, you know, as a composer, but also as the co-founder and artistic director of, of Sawdust. Um, as a composer, I lost work for at least a year, works I had been developing for many, many years. Uh, both the San Diego and Minnesota Opera Commissions were postponed. Works with Caramore, Chicago Symphony, uh, Ravinia, Cabrillo, and more were pushed back to who knows when. And psychologically, my will to create was like a light turned off. I'm used to creating from the abstract, but not with such a giant well of uncertainty. And I have a family to support. Um, financially, my artistic director's salary was off for a while, commissions were postponed, and so each day, uh, you know, each day has been kind of a struggle to find stability. And so, like many people, I came home, and I feel lucky, you know, to, to be able to come to my child, childhood home and kind of regather. Uh, creatively, I was able to kind of unlock myself with smaller collaborations. Uh, there was a recent collaboration with a friend of mine named Maria Popova and the Young People's Chorus, and it had me working with voice and film in really different ways. Uh, the kids, of course, are in isolation. And there was something about that collaboration, really being able to find the things that uh, really helped me kind of express these moments of, of uncertainty and isolation that, that felt really right. Uh, and it's actually released today on her brilliant brain picking site. Um, and slowly I'm finding my way back in. So a, a few things with Atlanta Opera, I'm creating a work called Sensoria Max, which is a chamber opera based on AI and disability. And now we're developing an online forum with a research to impact lab based in Copenhagen called an ACT Lab um, to help kind of create a generative space for the disability community surrounding questions in the opera. And it's allowed me to create uh, and collaborate internationally in ways that I don't think I would have foregrounded before. And I think this is one of the pluses of living uh, creatively in these times, this idea of uh, you know, extreme communication, forcing us to think more creatively, forcing us to you know, obviously yearn for more connection and hopefully act in ways that kind of create a collective consciousness, one would hope. So at Sawdust, um, we had to contract immediately because of the loss of revenue, but also because of preparing for the unknown. And so perhaps because we're so small, we were able to contract, reimagine, and then amplify our why, which is, you know, how do we turn this kind of, you know, tech mentoring hub and composition performance incubator into kind of a virtual hub. Um, and so what we did is we, we actually, you know, I had obviously immediately reached out to many people and was explaining, you know, the dire position we were in. And through all these contacts and this kind of web of, of human relationships, uh, we got an angel donation. I still don't know who the person is um, to essentially fund a di digital discovery festival. And that was really, in a way, as an artist, you know, you're always asked to do everything for free right now. And, and the idea is, of course, like we can't pay rent that way, right? So, how do we, you know, it's immediately? It's a six-figure gift, I believe, right? Yeah, it was a, it was an Amazing. incredible gift, and um, so that allowed us to, you know, support over a hundred emerging and established artists, um, and essentially, you know, turn the kind of mentoring that we typically give, which is much more kind of career-based, like how do you publish intellectual property, really into tech 
You know, so how do you deliver a really good sounding and visually looking product in this time? Uh, we gifted microphones and each artist gets paid a thousand dollars per half an hour stream and that goes through August. Um, and then I guess, you know, really, you know, fundamental to me is collaborating and that's also in the DNA of Sawdust. So we're continuing kind of thinking more strategically about some of the larger partners like Juilliard, who we partner with and how can we strengthen, you know, our very weak infrastructure at the moment through these larger partnerships, but then also thinking really strategically about partnering with like-minded smaller institutions or smaller companies um, like uh, Beth Morrison projects. Uh, and then I guess, you know, there's no doubt that this feeling of isolation and solitude is going to have an impact on the writing. And um, one of the things I'll be working on the fall is Old Man in the Sea. And, you know, I think I probably relate in a completely different way now to Santiago. Um, then thinking, rethinking aspects of those collaborations. So because choirs won't be convening till 2022, um, how do you put those in the electronics? Uh, but, you know, fundamentally we have to create. And so I think new forms are gonna emerge. Um, I think radio operas are gonna be a thing. People need visual breaks. We're on Zoom all the time. And, you know, how can kind of we return to a moment where our imaginations kind of expand in our head? Um, I think, you know, one of the other things is I, I'm working a lot more with my international colleagues. So my friend, the Mexican singer, Mago Serrera, and I are creating a piece about um, kind of choirs in isolation. Uh, and it's been really healing because we're actually filming these choirs. They'll eventually, you know, perform live on stage with a solo singer. Um, and it also addresses the fact that choirs are, are hit and will be kind of hit so hard in, in this pandemic. And then I guess finally to bring it around full circle, I've been thinking a lot about artists as leaders. Um, in one of the master classes that we hold on the festival, um, Mark Bumuthi, uh, Joseph, who's an incredible poet uh, and thinker, talked a lot about the role of like the new ecology of the arts. And he said, there has been uh, attention paid to the immediate stabilization of the field, some attention to the intermediate time in terms of philanthropy, but what's not happening is a co-design of the systems between artists and producers. Um, and he also says that the physical structures that we have inherited, um, you know, these kind of public spaces are essential in terms of social reintegration of this country. So I think the, uh, you know, finally that the art sector is gonna emerge, but it's gonna emerge differently and there's, um, I think a lot for a lot of the legacy institutions, there's a lot of looking at kind of what are their core missions and they need to do that because their, you know, their boards and their families are going to be supporting their raison d'etre. Um, and for, for, for composers, it's going to look very differently too. You know, right before this, we were in a moment of surplus. There were opportunities. We were finally getting to the conversation of inclusion. Um, in, independent producers were partnering with large production companies. And though I hope this will continue, I, I fear, um, you know, for the changes that we're gonna go through. Um, I think in terms of digital expressions, you asked, you know, what remains? I think some, some will remain as artifacts, you know, like 80s videos during MTV time. Um, but I hope that certain habits will remain. You know, being able to not travel for a rehearsal, how do you save, you know, both the environment and your time and your energy and how, you know, how remote connection has kind of really occurred in this time, I think that's incredible. I think these technologies, these Zoom technologies are gonna vastly improve um, so that we can hold rehearsals in a way that's not time-lapsed and you know, where it's AV over V, you know, audio over visual or visual over audio. I think that's really exciting. Um, and I think I worry about large-scale work and I am a lover and a maker of large-scale work. But I think as artists, you know, we're reimagining as our go-to basis. Um, so this morning I was talking to Alex Sanger of the Toolman Foundation and he said um, that it's about new forms and perhaps contracted forms. He said, if you can put 14 lines into a sonnet, uh, what's important to say? And I liked that. Yeah, no, that's beautiful. Can you, yeah. can you I, I think the point that you brought up sort of, and, and we talked about this earlier a little bit in our, in our conversation before this, is what, what issues does this crisis sort of really brought to light in the artist institutional uh, relationship. Um, you know, it feels like, uh, 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 you know, as I said in my opening statement, a lot of artists, they are the first ones to go in a way, although they are really at the center of the organizations or should be at the center of the organizations. And we talked about this a little bit too, and what you were talking about with the legacy institutions versus smaller institutions. Can you, can you expand on that a little bit? 
Yeah, I mean, I think it, it really comes down to when you're as when you're a small institution, you can pivot very quickly. And I think it really leads to, you know, Bamuthi's point, which is that you really need in order to really create a space where um, you know, where public spaces will be essential to life, you need to find a marriage between, you know, the thinkers and producers and the artists in order to really determine, um, obviously, the needs of the audiences, but also, you know, the needs of the artists. And so I think how I relate that to small institutions is obviously, I lead a small institution, I'm an artist. And so a lot of this kind of reimagining and repivoting and being able to just flip something on its head immediately is very much part of just, you know, having to find a way to survive as a, you know, woman composer in a field um, that I'm in, you know, in terms of wanting to do interdisciplinary work, trying to find support for that, um, and so on and so forth. So I think those skills are um, very much skills that artists possess and, and the, you know, larger institutions have a lot more to deal with. So I, I don't envy them. I think, I think there's, there's just, uh, you know, there's, there's a lot more to struggle with there in terms yeah. of boards yeah. and, and, and- Maybe this is even an appeal for artists to become leaders of institutions again, which is which is something that is so rare in the United States. Or at least partnering, you know, I think, you know, the yeah. idea of having, you know, an artistic director, an executive director, or a CEO, but also saying, you know what, I actually need this perspective in my uh, organization to really be able to flesh out a business plan because of, yeah. of course a business plan is just a story, you know, and the story has to be real and it has to reflect, you know, very, in a real way, uh, you know, what, what it's trying to heal, what it's trying to tell. And yeah. I think that disconnect is ever evident right now where you have, you know, all these, you know, individual artists for whom a thousand dollars is actually really meaningful because there are no support systems um, yeah. to help them create. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So. Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you. Dubois, um, give us your perspective. Uh, yeah. So, um, wow. Yeah. So it's been uh, an incredible time of uh, reflection and, uh, actually really restorative time for me um, prior to or right as the pandemic was kind of uh, becoming more serious and you know we got the stay-at-home order uh, just at that point maybe a week later I was preparing to um, head out to New Orleans for about a month almost a month and a half I was going to be in residency there and also uh, had a a NOLA premiere of an opera that I choreographed and performed in Charlie Parker's Yardbird, um, which made, I made my initial premiere with that work in uh, Arizona. So we're going to bring it to New Orleans and, you know, a lot of uh, energy was put around, you know, making that happen and, um, you know, gearing up for that. At the exact same time, I was preparing to have a world premiere of a work that I was commissioned to choreograph in Chicago with Red Clay Dance, uh, which is uh, kind of the first of a trilogy of works. Um, and, uh, and of course, all of those things are having to be shut down um, because of um, the gathering numbers. Uh, yeah, so that immediately sent me into um, a time of, you know, for about a week there, I was like, oh, you know, it's good to have some downtime. <laughs> like I, I travel, I have uh, traveled a lot. Uh, over the last five years, uh, you know, being with a touring company who toured a lot. Um, and so I was, and I just left that company in October. And so I was, I, and after leaving the company, I jumped straight into uh, a lot of work as a um, kind of freelance choreographer and, and creative director. Um, and so, yeah, I was, I was blessed with, I, I mean, and for me, this has kind of been a blessing in disguise to be able to be home with my one-year-old daughter and my wife. Um, and of course I have a creative agency and production company. So we were able to leverage that when in, in terms of resource um, and financial support, like how are we um, grappling with that part? So um, yeah, being blessed to be able to leverage that. And, you know, we have a client base that we're really uh, fortunate to have from, you know, large law firms that we're consulting from a creative standpoint, a branding standpoint to smaller, you know, startups that are thinking about how do they, um, you know, translate the work that they're doing in the marketplace to digital platforms, to remote, what I'm, what I'm calling this remote revolution. Um, so yeah, those are, those are kind of, uh, those were the initial kind of effects of, you know, COVID and how we're navigating that myself, my wife, uh, my family. Um, I've been really blessed to not have immediate loved ones who have been lost to the pandemic. So I, I just want to name that. I think that that's really 
important to name, whether it's through the the um, the disease itself or the 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 virus itself or other kind of uh, causes of, of the virus. Um, so I, I feel really fortunate for that. Um, yeah, that that that's that's mainly that's mainly my work. I mean, another thing with that is like. Um, you know, thinking about how are we staying creative. For me, uh, at, at the point that we were doing this work with uh, the Chicago uh, Dance Company, we did a short film uh, that kind of tracked the behind the scenes, the making of the work. And so, you know, fortunately, we had that content that the company was able to leverage and release as kind of a, um, you know, a supplement to to this work that was going to be a world premiere and, and no longer was able to be viewed by audiences. So we were able to release that to ticket buyers um, and have them still, you know, get something from, you know, being able to put out in that way or, you know. Yeah. So we had that, yeah, short film. And then other things, like I had another short film that I just produced at, at Pier 59 uh, with a beautiful dancer, Michael Jackson Jr. at Ailey. Asher, you probably know him. Um, so we did a film with him and we put that out. Um, and so, yeah, we've just been able to kind of leverage uh, those things on the back end where we, where I, I haven't been touring or traveling as much for commission work. What really strikes me about what you're doing is that, you know, and I see that with a lot of younger dancers and choreographers now, mm -hmm. that they just do not really believe in that model anymore that you go to the dance school and then you get picked up by a company and you basically, you know, you're set up for life. But basically you have to be your own enterprise. You have to be this dance choreography, enterprise and you've sort of diversified already before the crisis and so you are not so dependent on institutions on the on the on those classical you know not-for-profit institutions anymore yeah um you know are so hard hit basically and that's yeah. why it seems like you are able to weather this crisis in a in, in a fairly you know good kind of way was that a very conscientious decision of yours already before because you saw sort of that institutional company model, uh, 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 you know, aging, um, or can you talk a little bit about that? Absolutely, yeah. So I, I was, I keep saying blessed. That's my word of the day, I guess. I was so blessed to attend FSU, uh, you know, which is one of the top um, dance university programs. Um, and through attending that institution, which is kind of a conservatory within the university system, a lot of the making of the artists there was very holistic like it's kinesiology it's the dance sciences it's dance technology where you're learning filmmaking and these kinds of things even prior to that growing up i already had i always had like an affinity to visual arts like uh you know filmmaking and uh, photography things like that so i knew even going into this company job uh just after college uh, that those interests were there and then I was fortunate to be surrounded by a lot of other artists and other disciplines who helped me hone those crafts, those perspectives about, you know, interdisciplinary um, integration in that way, especially thinking from a business standpoint about entrepreneurship and business ownership. Um, so even during my time with the company, I was always pushing uh into other spaces outside of the performance space i was always like well what how how are we branding this company how are we you know we did a we did a company uh rebrand and did a new website and you know i was um over the merch shooting for you know the new content that came out there working with artists to develop the merch and um so i've always been pushing boundary in that regard and then shortly after joining the company after being in the company for about two years, I um, launched a Kane brand, the creative agency and production company. And so it was always strategic for me because I just didn't see the, the non-for-profit or not-for-profit model, the 501c3 as a sustainable model for the type of work that I wanted to do. And I, and I grappled with um, always being positioned or primarily being positioned as someone who needed to reach out in order to create the work that i wanted to do so self-producing became really important for me um aligning myself with uh artists who i could collaborate at a big level um 
to to do these bold these bold words but not be confined to having to check off boxes and also uh through the lens of philanthropic work like i didn't want my philanthropic work to be bound by uh needing to check off boxes because that felt and, and i and a lot of artists um do that work so ethically and, and with so much um heart and and really grounded in their values and i've been fortunate to be a part of those organizations and work alongside them for me that didn't seem like the best route and yeah. so I believe that I want, I mean, my goal is to be able to do my, my work as a philanthropist, my work as an activist, um, and, and still be able to sustain myself in moments like a crisis where, you know, I'm not looking for the next grant or the next, yeah. Yeah. or having a board meeting and people saying, we can't go in that direction. And I'm like, well, this is my vision in the first place, you know? So, um, yeah, that was a strategic, always a very strategic um, yeah. way to- Thank you, thank you. I mean, yeah. Azure, you're, you're, you're probably you're also in, in two worlds you started so you have sort of your own company uh but you're also obviously doing a lot of work with a lot of international and big companies and so tell us a little bit about your experience sort of over the last two and a half months now it is already yeah um well like you say i split my time so i've um i i split it with you know commissioning work as well as abna azure barton and artists um I created that, oh my gosh, 19, 18 years ago, I guess, to have a sense of autonomy. Um, and I, 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 I'm, I feel, you know, my word of the day is the same as Dubois, in uh, that I, I am very grateful that I have um, my hands in both places. I'm incredibly uh fulfilled by doing commissioning work i love the the connection the community the the artists i get to to meet um i'm also um always carving out time to create my own projects and to be self-reliant so i i though it has been somewhat of a kick in the ass you know it's as you know i have this auto this autonomy however because i produce a lot of my own work and if i'm not working where are the funds that are going to support the work that i'm making you know um so it's it's creative thinking and i'm i'm um i'm i am like i said i'm very grateful to have my hand in 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 both worlds um i was right now Really, what? The, the, what are what is uh, just give us a, also a little bit of an overview of what is the work that you've actually lost in terms of yeah. So right now I was supposed to be I was supposed to be working with uh, beautiful Cuban dancers uh, in El Paso. Yes. Um, and starting a new creation with them, I absolutely adored working with them, and um, it was a really powerful experience for me. Um, we had uh, this period booked out and then December um, and January upcoming, but it's all been canceled. Um, even the future, I mean, the future for them is so rocky, uh, unfortunately, um, for all of us, right? Um, uh, right before this, I was to be with um, Houston Ballet. Um, and I should say we, so wherever I go, I bring my collaborators with me. I try to as much as possible. So ABNA, you know, we are traveling together, which is, which is awesome. Um, and uh, a support system that I really appreciate. Um, so Houston Ballet was canceled. Um, Alvin Ailey American Dance Theater was touring. Um, this was their high time, I guess, for a touring busk work that I created for my own group a while back. Um, they're, canceled of course and then the summer uh was supposed to be sent spent with my beloved team my dancers and uh stage manager and lighting designer and costume designer you know i think we often forget the the other people that are involved in these projects and um it's a it's an intense struggle for 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 many you know not just the choreographer and dancer but um for Were for all of us and, were you able to get any PPP money for, for your dancers, sort of? Um, well, this project, the, the interesting thing about this project is I had um, Kupnagel in Germany um, and uh, Jacob's Pillow and UCLA and the Ford 
they were partnering and they were producing the project. So they were hiring all of us as independents, um, which was, which was a lovely way of working. Actually. I mean, I, I, I liked this, um, way of working. Um, however, it all fell out. <laughs> so, um, we were supposed to be performing in August and into the fall and then the fall engagements. Um, I'm supposed to be choreographing my first opera, which I've never, you know, at LA opera. And now, you know, it, the, the, the the director Christopher is very optimistic. Um, it will happen at some point. Yeah. It, uh, it just depends on when, and um, that involves myself and some of my dancers. So hopefully that happens. And then some stagings. Um, so that's another thing too. I have four different stagers that are out there um, staging work, and so work has been canceled for them as well. It's a bit yeah. of a bummer. Um, we talked about, you talked about some companies where, where you feel they're doing some really interesting work sort of during this crisis and sort of new ways of collaborating or, or uh, where, you know, where, where companies sort of started to collaborate and open really up through, which they're forced to do through, sort of through this pandemic. I think one of the things in, in the United States that always struck me too is that companies are very self-isolating. Everyone is sort of fighting for their own survival. They're, they're protecting their donors, you know. They, they are very, they're very, it's very insular. And you talked about some interesting examples where that is sort of opening up a, a little bit. And I think especially in the dance world where you have, you know, this is the style of the New York City Ballet and this is an ABT and, you know, where this is Alvin Ailey and, you know, you, we have to sort of protect our brand and our style. Um, uh, talk a little bit about those um, examples that you, you, you see where, where things are, are, are moving into an interesting sort of new direction, maybe. Yeah, I, well, I've been talking about this for a long time with um, one of my dear collaborators and partners, Jonathan Alsbury. And um, uh, we have uh, this freedom which we've created for ourselves in terms of um, uh, traveling to and collaborating with many different artists and designing our own ways of working, I would say. Um, but there has always been a question of, of, of um, how can we and how can these um, institutions uh, change their thinking and, and become more flexible and more realize that this is a one big uh, community. Wherever you go, you realize the institutions are functioning quite similarly. And uh, I, I am, was really, really happy to see that there are, I mean, it's baby steps, right? There are, there are classes being held um, where, for example, Hubbard Street Dance Chicago is taking class with Alvin Ailey Dance Theater. And then ABT is allowing Hubbard Street then to participate in some of their classes. And there's just this crossbreeding right now, which I don't know, to be honest, if it will last. Yeah, um, it's that it started. It's really lovely that it started. And I think that the it's essential. I mean, in this moment, what I have been reminded of, of um, the, the importance of my own self-practice, you know, of that stillness, but also of I'm being taught how much we need each other. <laughs> and as much as I've created this autonomous... Um, mini universe that travels around uh, the world as much as, as I wanted to believe that I was self-sufficient. Um, I need others and they, they, they would hopefully need us as well. So, yeah. you know, I'm right. realizing that it is an, is a, is a wonderful opportunity for, for, and possibility to remember the essentials and, and that is that human connection. Yes, no, thank you. But also they have yeah. to survive and a lot of your dancers probably they're without salaries at the moment and without income. Uh, Taylor, yeah. you are many, many things. One thing you're not, you're not a choreographer, but uh, a lot of other things. Or, 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 uh, I, 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 <laughs> I know how to move an audience around. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and you're a dancer on stage and through songs and everything and music, but um, mm. give us your, your, your thoughts a, a little bit um, from your beautiful home. Uh, on my beautiful home. Uh, well, I, you know, like everybody, I got had everything got canceled. So uh, I had a play. I'd been working on for seven years. We were just about to open. That got canceled. Uh, we had an international tour coming up. 
Uh, we're going to Singapore and Zurich and Athens and all those places I hadn't been to before. And, um, and that all got canceled. And probably the biggest thing is we were going to bring 24 decade, uh, four, six hour shows back to New York. And, you know, it probably will maybe still happen in the future, but at a really nice venue and kind of like as a last kind of, haha, we did it, you know, we, um, we toured the world and now we're bringing it back home or one last big hurrah. Um, and as a generative artist, I think the, the, the thing that strikes me about all this is, um, and when, I, when a gig of mine gets canceled, it means, well, for bringing 24 back back to New York, it meant about 200 people lost their jobs. So um, so that's the that's the real kind of pain in it. And but also the OK, how do we figure out how to help, help people um, is uh, because I'm fine. This goes to your other question. I'm I'm fine creatively right now. I mean, I. I, I I don't, I, I'm not very disciplined when it comes to exercise and <laughs> learning a new language and all those other things. But when it comes to writing and working, that, that, I don't got a problem with that discipline. But um, so I can do it in, when I'm poor, or when I'm wealthy, when I'm whatever. But, uh, but I, um, right now, uh, I find uh, that it, the biggest challenge is to figure out how to uh, help other people. So I, I created this thing called Trickle Up NYC, which is um, I created with a bunch of other people. And uh, it's basically a streaming site, uh, a network. And uh, we got all these artists to donate three videos each, which was, a, you know, seemed like a reasonable ask. Um, uh, original content, just you can make it on your cell phone, super easy. Uh, and we've got, I think, 160 videos up right now, and people have been subscribing to pay. It's $10 a month to pay to see all this cool stuff from Paula Vogel and Lynn Nottage and Susan Way Parks and and Christine, the wonderful drag queen Christine, and uh, and we got burlesque performers and Basil Twist, you know, so like tons and tons of different kinds of artists are up there. Um, Miguel Gutierrez, uh, Faye Driscoll, uh, choreographers. And... Um, and and so what's what that has done is it's uh, we've been able to raise now uh, forty thousand um, dollars and I wanted big chunks. Uh, the great thing about the subscription model is every month uh, it renews, so you can pay somebody new every month. Or if you if you raise um, your subscriptions to even more, then you can get even more people money. So it, it was this kind of neat model. I thought we're giving all of our money to. Uh, the executives of Netflix and you know most of those shows show um, work that we would find unethical like you know women getting raped every on every single TV show in the, on the planet and people using guns and killing everybody and you know <laughs> none of us actually want to support that and yet we're giving our money to it so uh, why not make a site where it's you know artists putting what they want to put up and um, and so that it's been really great uh, and, and they're big chunk commissions because the micro grant stuff is wonderful uh, and important but I also felt that uh, then you you buy your groceries and then you're still in an emergency place so I wanted to figure out how to give people um, a big chunk of change so we gave out um, we've given out now we're about to give out our fourth uh, four ten thousand dollar commissions um, and I just think it's a great model. I just think, you know, if every theater in the country got on board with this, the same thing and put all their online content on on the same thing and we all had one kind of subscription um, platform, we could we could have 100,000 subscribers and or more, a million subscribers and $10 a month each. And we could, we could be giving out um, $1,000, $10,000 commissions every month. It's an incredible, wonderful model, but uh, you know, I, I have doubt that the theaters would ever want to get on board with it because everybody wants, you know, wants their little thing. How do you? I mean, sort of going back to that question also that I asked uh, Paola. I mean, what how what what issues has this crisis maybe uncovered sort of in the relationship between artists and institutions? I mean, it feels like you started this trickle up. Uh, uh, network as an as an artist as a sort of more seasoned artist who wants to help a younger generation and the people who submitted videos are obviously sort of in that uh, uh, you know downtown or cutting edge sort of performance scene you know more slightly more established um, artists certainly not mainstream artists in any kind of way um, but what are institutions actually doing really to support artists or why isn't this 
platform that you created, one that's been embraced by 10 major New York sort of institutions to provide. Well, I mean, all the, yeah, all the institutions have, uh, not all of them, but m many of them have agreed to be promotional partners. So they'll send out an email about it. And that, that has helped. Um, but uh, everybody has gone into their own camp to make online content. And it's because they feel they have an obligation to their audiences. And what I have an obligation is to my community and my, and the artists and, um, and to ingenuity to a degree, you know, how can we, how can we invent our way out of the calamity of this uh, event? And um, so that's, that's, that's how I work. And uh, if any institutions out there want to come on board, we, we, we <laughs> sure would welcome you. You said to me, <laughs> and I got no ego, girl. I got no ego. You can call it yours. You can <laughs> say you took it over. <laughs> call it yours, girl. <laughs> You said to me before that you that you feel like we're trying to sort of solve a problem that we don't really understand the full extent yet. Can, yeah, you, yeah, yeah. can you talk about Well, that's where the future comes for me. Uh, I don't know what the future is going to hold because I don't know what the problem is yet. I don't know if we're all going to have to sit 10 feet apart at the theater or if there's going to be a vaccine in a few months or the vaccine's not going to come for 10, 10 more years. Hey, Larry Kramer just died. Yeah, uh, uh, but um, but I but I, what I feel is that uh, what what I do know this time is providing is um, more downtime. I think for some people, I can't say that for everybody because uh, there's a lot of zooming. But um, but it does seem like uh, we're not able to perform necessarily to a live audience. So is, is this a time to reflect and meditate on the sabbatical and on commissions? And could we change the culture to commission, commission, commission? And could we change the culture to value the sabbatical and the meditation? And um, that, would be, that would be pretty cool. So that's my hope for the future is that maybe we could yeah. learn how to do that more now, um, practice now, and then, more and then learn how to do it more in the future. Yeah, yeah. I mean, of course, you have to be able to afford a sabbatical, right? Well, yeah, it's not saying, it's not about, uh, it's not about ignoring the economics of it. It's about addressing the economics of it. How can we get more commissions? How can, how can we get, you know, and, and I don't think rich people are always the solution, you know, because philanthropy is... Uh, frankly, it's unethical. Like it shouldn't exist in the first place. I mean, I'm a beneficiary of it, and I uh, thank you, thank you, thank you. But it shouldn't exist. You know, we should have a system, a government system that um, pays everybody uh, an appropriate amount for living. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, so, how would you feel about performing? You know, a 24-hour um, decade in a 2,000-seat house with 300 audience members all spread out, sort of throughout the theater. Is that? No. No, I had a, I I thought about it for a while, and I was trying to wonder about it, but no, that that's not the solution for us. But um, but maybe we'll figure something out. I also think it's okay for things not to happen. Yeah, I just do. I just think it's okay. If, I mean, it, it made me really sad that my play after seven years uh, didn't even get to open, and these kids, it was young pre professionals that were um, working on it, and they'd given so much of their time and energy and love to it, and. And then, you know, none of them got to even open the play. And, and so yeah. it, that, makes me, that makes me sad, but um, it's not a tragedy. Mm -hmm. yeah. It's, yeah. It, you know, it just isn't, so. Um, it's really inspiring to hear you speak about this, Taylor. Yeah. It, <laughs> Thank you. No, it really is because I, I've spent a lot of time, a part of my big practice right now is, you know, there's, there's separating these windows out and one of them is communicating with other artists and also with presenters and um, producers. And there is um, a worry that I have that, that, um, that I've heard from producers and presenters that they're more concerned about keeping their donors on board and they're worried about the livelihood of them and the the connection and the you know they're comforting them and there isn't a mention of the artists you know th so that yeah. is something that is um it's uh, it's completely backwards well and yeah. the donors well, are there to actually support the art you know exactly. so if the art making isn't happening they, they you know they're not yeah, there to yeah. just support i will say that 
Yeah, and it was it was the reason I had the idea for this is because of Elizabeth Suedos, who she put my name forward for my the first grant I ever got, and it was seven thousand dollars, and it changed my life. Mm -hmm. And I didn't have to apply. She just it was an artist helping another artist. I didn't have to apply. I just got seven thousand dollars. Every moment before that time in my life, I was trying to figure out how to buy food and live, you know, day to day, let alone week to week. And every moment after that moment, I was ahead of that financial <laughs> curve, <laughs> like the disaster of the financial curve. So, so then I was, I was, uh, my life has been, uh, you know, just so much easier since that moment. And I thought, well, that's what, that's what's going to change somebody's life, you know. Yeah. You know? And it's also, giving, oh, sorry, sorry, go ahead, sir. No, no, go ahead. No, I was just saying that it's, it's also, um, giving artists something to look forward to in terms of these producers being able to curate and show the work as well. So it's not just about mm. process, which I think process is, I mean, I live for process. I love process yeah. making, making, but it's also nice that you're producing, you're presenting the work, you know? So I think that um, producers can also be thinking about um, in what way can we create whether it's an outdoor festival or it's an online festival or, or you know these micro grants or larger grants that give dancers and artists something to work towards as well, well and the thing is it's all part of a solution you know it's all of these things together are going to form a way forward but i think one thing that you said that that was really interesting to me is this idea that you know some of the work that's canceled may not see the the light of day and i think part of what and obviously that's really challenging from, from all fronts, but what's interesting about that is in two years, we may not, I mean, we're not gonna psychologically be in the same place. I'm already attracted to different right. content. I'm already thinking about different things. And, and it's like, it's yeah. such a radical shift that it's hard to say this work that I've been working on for seven years needs to be done no matter what in two or three years. I don't know, you know? So it's, yeah. a, it's an interesting dilemma in terms of investment and, and time. We have, a really, we have a really interesting question from, uh, from a viewer um, um, through Facebook, and she asks, um, Beth Pinsker is asking, do you think, and this goes to anyone who wants to grab this first, do you think this crisis might deter the future generation from getting involved in the arts due to fear of financial security, job stability? How can current artists mitigate that fear to ensure the successful future of arts and entertainment? <laughs> You don't want to hear what I have to say, so I won't say it. <laughs> I do. Now we do. Yeah, I think I think now we want to hear it. <laughs> I just, I just, I just think there's too many people in the arts to begin with. So, like, yeah. be nice if a few of them that don't really need to be in it. I, I, everybody's creative. Everyone should be creative. Everyone should be encouraged to be creative. There should be way more diversity within the field. That is all true, but, uh, but we don't need 500 million educational programs that are turning out artists, 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 mm. artists, 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 artists. It's not what we need. Yeah. Dubois, what do you, you, you <laughs> No, I was, yeah, I, I can agree with that. I also think that there, um, that's, that's always been <laughs> a narrative that's been pushed. Like, oh, if you become an artist, you won't be able to live. Like <laughs> you won't be able to afford, afford anything. Like that's always been, um, at the, at least in my experience, and I'm only 29, so I say it humbly, humbly. But um, yeah, that's always been a narrative. And again, it speaks to this, it speaks to one of my always goals, or not even goals, one of my intentions to always, you know, like thinking about myself, even at, you know, 18, 19, when I first started training as a dancer, formally, you know, how am I going to be, how am I going to live sustainably? Like, I want to have a family, I want to have kids, I want to have generational wealth, you know? And so I think that when we uh, don't um, narrow ourselves down to one label, first off, like, I'm more than an artist, I'm, an, I'm a father, I'm a son, I'm a, you know, like all of these other things, I'm a businessman, I am a, a filmmaker, you know, and, and labels can get thrown around, blah, blah, blah. But I think that when we don't narrow narrow that in so much, um, we give ourselves the freedoms to say like, oh, I do artistic work here, but I'm also expressing myself in this kind of way here. And maybe my art doesn't, at, in one season, make the bulk of my income, but I'm sustaining it by doing these mm -hmm. other things. And, and they're not being some type of hierarchy of, 
you know, the artists who live solely off of commission work or the artists who live solely off of performing are the true artists and these other people are not. I think so there's there's a, a lot around the rhetoric as we're as we're teaching as educators are breeding new artists and also just like um, the romantic the rom uh, the romanticizing of the starving artist that has been so long in the world. Um, like, oh, to be an artist, you got to suffer and you got to be broke and you got to do the things. And it's like, actually, I'm trying to make money, be happy, live sustainably, be ethical, you know, mm -hmm. and those are my human rights. Um, and also, yeah. like, think, thinking, I love what you just said. Also, you know, why just New York, Chicago, L.A.? Like, why all the big cities? I mean, there can be local scenes. There can be, also, you know, all sorts of different thriving artistic lives um, that that I think can be sustainable on different levels, just different yeah. scales. And I think that's, that's uh, important. Yeah. You know? like, yeah, I think, the, I think the, um, sorry. No, no, go ahead. Uh, as uh, just, I was just gonna say too, that I think the, um, the freelancers right now are, are that in a way they're the ones that I've been speaking to, they're used to the hustle, you know, they're used to being creative and they're the ones that are, they're okay at the moment, you know. Um, and thinking outside the box. I mean, I have two of my collaborators are also farmers, for example. They're returning to the land, which is really inspiring for me to think, okay, what are your essentials? What do you really need? Like I can create um, in what form? What does that look like? Um, so I, I do think that there are, uh, there are some amazing things that are going to come out of this. I think that's an interesting point, sort of the idea of what do you really need? And I'm, I mean, I, I think there's, there's, you know, more outside of the United States, there's much more of a philosophical debate, you know, even in mainstream media, et cetera, et cetera, going on to really think about what are the learnings from this crisis and not just about, you know, being better prepared, obviously all of those things, but also how do we maybe need to change our way of life? You know, not setting up those pins, not setting up the bowling alley pins in the same way anymore. And I feel that is sadly a conversation that is somewhat lacking um, um, in this country. And it would be great. I feel this is a conversation though, that you as artists are probably having among, among each other, um, but maybe to create more of that collaboration community, that joint voice in a way to um, bring that forward. Um, one interesting, one question from uh, Clara Rodriguez um, from Madrid. Um, um, how does the artistic community value the fact of not having enough support to face the difficult current and future situation when during confinement their work has been essential for many millions of people? Um, how do you sort of see that? Obviously, I'm sure all of you have been asked to create, you know, or somewhat also expected, you know, free bit online content, music performances, uh, a, a dance work or something like that. Um, that has helped, um, um, you know, people to sort of weather this um, a, a crisis. Um, how how does that feel? I mean, I think you have to find ways to not make it free, um, and and that's you know one of the interesting things that's changing in in the music industry. You know, is is obviously you know streaming and paying for streaming and new publishing deals and. It's, 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 it's like the wild west at the moment because everything is changing so quickly, um, but it's important that it change. And I think, you know, monetizing streams and monetizing the artwork and making sure that the, you know, quality is as best and that people are equipped to be able to create in this medium is kind of the transition that, that has to happen because we may be in this position for another year. Yeah, um, so. I think it is a balance as well. I think um, with, with the online classes, for example, that are happening right now, I'm loving my Cunningham and my ballet classes and taking classes with artists that have actually been there for me. I'm trying to take their classes to be there as a, as a body to um, support. Um, but in a way, there, th this, this forum has brought s dance into homes and environments. Unfortunately, not enough people have computers to um, actually have access or have cell phones to have access a lot more are having access to these free classes which yeah. is wonderful however um does it devalue the artist and um as soon as you know there were a lot of freelance dancers needing to teach to to get by 
And as soon as ABT, Cunningham, all these classes, um, these big institutions started teaching free classes, um, it does affect these other artists who then um, don't have the students showing up to their classes and then don't have people paying for their classes. Yeah. Right. So, I guess the big question really also is whether this pandemic is creating an even larger split between, you know, those who have, who are able to afford all these digital channels of communication, computers and, and, mm -hmm. and, and internet and all, and who have access to it and those who don't. Um, I read recently somewhere in a, in, in, a, in, a, in a newspaper, you know, that isolation, um, so, I mean, uh, social distancing is the new luxury basically. And we all know, of course, that a lot of the COVID-19 uh, uh, victims are predominantly are, are, are a much higher percentage of, of people of color and uh, and from uh, you know poor communities. Um, um, so even this pandemic, uh, whereas you know sort of in the beginning it felt like it brought the world together and it still did in a way, but it also it also really enhanced the inequality um, um, sort of that we. Um, and it'll be a, yeah, it'll be a generational one because if you think about schooling, like my son gets to go to school online because his school is you know offering that. There are schools that I know here on the border, there there are no schools. March came and they're out. You know they they don't have the system to be able to to even create a digital program. So that means that generationally, this is going to be something that will you know not to be too dark, but that will you know that will. Really I saw the most disturbing thing I've ever seen. I think. <laughs> which I, a little hyperbole there, but, but I, there, we don't have the internet up here as you know, a whole town that they don't have the fibers. So, but the library has a dish. So um, they broadcast the internet uh, and people drive their cars to the library parking lot and they park and they, and these kids are all doing their homework in the parking lot in their cars. And the other day, I, um, well, I go there in order to do this kind of stuff. And, uh, and I went <laughs> and for a, a whole week. There was this kid sitting in a Hummer in the back seat of his Hummer doing his homework. And I just found the dichotomy of that to be so disturbing. <laughs> and that is America in a nutshell. <laughs> we, have, uh, last, we have time for one last question. Um, this is from a friend, uh, Ross Sulkas from. Uh, from uh, uh, London, I'm sure all the dancers and choreographers among you know who she is. She's a, a great cultural writer for uh, The New Yorker and, and writes about dance. Uh, her question is, how interested are you as artists in finding ways to create remotely with others via Zoom or other platforms? Um, I think this is a very simple but also very poignant question. Maybe each one of you can, can, can answer that question and then maybe at the end, uh, because this is sort of a, uh, I, I want to sort of wrap things up then. This was a, a tradition that we started in our last meeting, in our last uh, uh, call, uh, uh, um, a conversation, that you talk about or, or just give a brief example of a work art, of art that has been particularly meaningful for you during this uh, pandemic that you want to share with, with others. But first, answer Roz's question and then maybe talk a little bit about about that. Paula, do you want to go first or you're still thinking? I think Taylor, <laughs> I was thinking you know about the work of art. Gonna... I was like, oh God. <laughs> Taylor, you know already what you're going to say, I think. So, do you want to go first, Taylor? <laughs> no. All right, I'll go, Yarn. It's okay. I'll go. Um, 100%. I'm interested in collaborating in this form. Obviously, you know, as composers, um, the sound limitations of Zoom are really you know, as musicians, it's really stressful because it, you know, just reduces, um, reduces the kind of scope that we're used to hearing in. But I'm interested in it so far as kind of communication and being able to collaborate internationally. Uh, and I'm certainly, you know, have dabbled like everybody into this idea of like, you know, filming the processes. Um, but mostly it's just allowed me to communicate with this kind of international reach and stay connected and kind of further um, collaborations, but also do it in a way, um, as I mentioned before, really fro foregrounding um, the kind of interconnectedness and, uh, and uh, kind of international collaboration that is needed in, ver in very specific, you know, projects of mine. So, for example, the, the project I was mentioning on disability and AI, you know, really being able to collaborate internationally uh, with the community is really important for that project. Um, and the in terms work of, of art? Sorry, yeah, in terms of a work of art that has moved me tremendously, um, 
I have to admit, I'm not doing a lot of listening right now, ex except for, you know, the things that I'm curating. I sometimes tune in because I, I love it. Um, so every week I've been listening to a different piece on Fridays. My friend Helga Davis and I moderate um, a masterclass together. Mm. And that has been my one time that I listen to music really deeply is when I have, you know, someone like um, Vijay Gupta and Rina Esmail you know, and they were collaborating together. That was beautiful and deep. And I get to ask them questions, you know, and um, we have Robert Wilson coming up or Ted Hearn. Those are moments where I can really kind of meditate and listen. That's beautiful. Yeah. Dubois. Yeah. Um, so I'm going to keep my answer to the question really, really short, because there's something, there was something bubbling up for me, even in the last thought when we were talking about kind of quality of life, ethics, equality. Um, yes, I'm interested in um, creating through these digital mediums. I think it's really important. I think it, it's almost uh, beyond my desire or, or wanting to do that. I think there's a, a necessity there. Um, and I think that's becoming more and more evident each day. Works of art that have really spoken to me. My wife and I have been uh, blazing through This Is Us on Netflix, speaking of Netflix. Um, or is that Netflix? No, that's Hulu. Uh, this is us, an incredible show. I think it is a work of art. Um, and then Brene Brown's book, uh, Dare to Lead. Both of those have been really speaking to me. Um, but about the piece about quality of life and inequality and how, and I, I said I wasn't going to do this because I'm the only Black person on the panel, but I always have to do this. Anytime you're the only Black person on the panel, you have to speak to these things. But it's, 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 um, it's, uh, I just want to, lift if nothing else i want to lift up the name of george floyd um who was just murdered uh heinously by the white policeman um and ahmad i want to lift those names up because i think when we're talking about how uh communities of color and folks who are um of lower economic status how they're being affected during this time and social distancing as a luxury all these things we've been kind of throwing around even language like tragedy canceled loss ethics um as we're thinking about our art making processes i think um just being mindful of that and and uh, yeah, just quality of life and and value the value of human life beyond the value of artistic expression or the value of the artist, um, but the value of just human life um, feels really pressing for me. And yeah, I said I was going to do it, but I had to do it. Um, I don't want to even apologize for that because that's my own inferiority uh, surfacing. So, um, but yeah, I was just really like about to erupt as we were talking about um, the last bit about value and, and quality of life and, and luxury and uh, those things. So, yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Dubois. Azure. Um, you know, for the first few weeks of this pandemic, I really um, went inward. And um, as my father says, nothing exists without you, so listen. <laughs> um, so I tried to, to do that for a while, and I really um, was resistant. Um, actually, no, I should say I was using Zoom as a tool to connect with my family, which I think was really, uh, I never spoke to my mother as much um in the past as i as i am doing now and having dinner parties and cooking parties and things like that um through zoom which i really 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 appreciated um also teaching at usc um i was uh, resistant in the beginning and then um by the end of the practice i i really i really really appreciated it um and then so so professionally i i didn't go there i was i was really about you know stilling my mind and going inward and really connecting with what's important and I was archiving works and, and then just yesterday I decided to um, start with um, one of my dear friends and collaborators um, a zoom experiment which is creating through zoom and how to use this tool in a, in a, in a new kind of way for me to, to actually be able to create work for the camera um, and to, to we um, everything from we spent 
three hours just fooling around and, and, and discovering and playing. And I think um, we're going to be doing this going forward. And I, I'm actually really excited about it right now. Um, so yeah, I think that there's... And we'll, we should bring it on all arts too. Yeah, I, I'm, um, I'm really excited about it. I've been also choreographing some objects, which has been really fun. And I started doing that with Zoom yesterday. So I think that there are some, there's some fun things to discover, um, connecting with dancers. I'm, um, I, yeah, I was really curious to see so much about my work is that um, human connection, I'm realizing. Um, and I thought, you know, am I going to be able to have that intuition and that connection? And, and I was surprised um, it's not the same. Yeah. I really miss, I just want to like reach out, drives me crazy to be looking at this all the time. Um, but yesterday I, I put a, a black, sh uh, this is actually this kind of poke that blanket over my head. I was like, I need, I need to be able to focus because I'm distracted by so many things. So I put this thing over my head and I just sat there for three hours and it was actually really moving. And uh, so I'm excited about it. Um, see what, what is the work of art. Is there one that has meant, that has meant a lot to you during yeah. this I would, the first thing that came to my mind was um, a few days ago, I watched uh, an interview um, with a young dancer who's working, um, I wrote it down, um, and Weisbaden, that company in Germany, Heisch, Wiesbaden, Wiesbaden. <laughs> there's a young dancer um, named, ah, 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 ah. Um, oh shoot, I had his name right in front of me. Um, and I hadn't heard of him before. Announceable. This young choreographer, he's working on his third piece ever, and it was so incredibly moving to hear him talk about his choreography. And um, I can- Oh wow, uh, send us the link and we'll put it- Yeah, I'll, I'll send you the link because um, it, was, it was one of the, uh, Marco Snovash. Okay. I don't know how to say his name. Uh, he's Brazilian, and um, mm -hmm. it was just really enlightening and really hopeful and uh, really beautiful to listen to him talk. Thank you, thank you, Taylor. You're last. <laughs> I'll keep it brief. Uh, I think uh, that breaking the patterns. You know, that's what art is supposed to do. It's supposed to break our patterns, anyway. So I think the, the only, the best thing about all of this is that I feel like, uh, even though I have a freelance life, and most of my friends all have freelance lives. Uh, it's broken all of our patterns up and um, we really uh, love each other a lot. We're on our little devices loving each other up a lot. <laughs> so that's been very nice. Uh, in terms of a, um, a film or a film, in terms of something that's inspirational, I just watched Gandhi again for the first time in like 30 years or something and it's a little hokey. Um, but it's also magnificent. And uh, I, I just find it inspiring that, that the man uh, can invent uh, civil disobedience, you know, that go walk and make some salt at the ocean, you know, and an entire country changes. I just, I just find that, um, I find it really moving. So, Great. Well, thank watch you Gandhi so again. <laughs> thank you everyone for joining us for our second talk. We, uh, um, you know, for me, there were a few interesting themes. I mean, a lot of, you know, diversified opinions and interesting themes that emerged. The idea of the relationship between the artists and the institutions, maybe smaller institutions are more nimble than larger ones to, 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 to grasp really these challenges. The value of human life, the artists as leaders, I think is a really important one. The need for more collaboration among institutions, but also really also among the artists. The need for innovation and philanthrop philanthropy and uh, support for the arts and really diversifying also who you are as an artist to sort of get through this crisis. And the question of whether we are on the cusp of a digital renaissance or whether that is just a gimmick and really where um, uh, the future is and maybe taking much more of a pause and, uh, and, uh, and sort of let the arts reemerge um, um, themselves rather than forcing them to, to, uh, to open up. Um, thank you again also to our viewers uh, for joining us. In two weeks, uh, Karen Brooks Hopkins uh, is putting together a group of international arts leaders that are giving us their insight 
what the situation of the cultural sector is internationally in these um, um, uh, countries and, uh, and, and, and what these governments or institutions are doing there to support the arts and the artists. I think we've all uh, looked very jealously at, uh, at Germany uh, where, you know, six weeks ago, I think Angela Merkel and the cultural minister issued um, a 55 billion um, euro uh, health uh, uh, support package for the arts. And there's, I think, a second um, um, uh, uh, edition already uh, been issued. Um, so uh, we'll have someone from Germany and from other countries on that panel to give us more of the international and broader perspective. Thank you again to Taylor. Paula um, Dubois and Azure for joining us today. And thank you everyone for listening and for watching and continue watching and subscribing to All Arts. There's no fee, it's all free, no advertisement. Um, thank you so much and uh, goodbye. So much, thank, thank you. Thank you, bye bye.